Hey, dear listener, welcome to episode 68 of Double DM, the TTRPG talk show about making your games better. This episode is called How to Identify When to Say No. This episode, we will discuss how you, as a dungeon master, can and sometimes have to say no. We discuss identifying those situations when they arise and what a game master actually does for the table and why it is on them to shut down certain ideas. If you are using Spotify, you should also be able to answer our episode's question in the description of this episode. We would love to hear from you when you had to shut down ideas before and why you did it. I also have a small teaser for you, as next week's Wednesday, on the 1st of June, we will release a special surprise for you all. Keep your eyes peeled and your ears locked for your feeds and for social media when that drops. And now, let's dive into episode 68 and find out when and how to say no. And with that, welcome to episode 68 of Double DM. Nils, how are you doing today? I am doing awesome. I'm a bit speechless because we just had our interview with Homie and the Dude. And Which is coming out in two weeks. Exactly. And that was that was fucking amazing. I enjoyed that a lot. It, it yeah. Yeah. Two very inspiring people, Tom and Bori are incredibly insightful incredibly talkative as well but mm -hmm. i was happy to give them the time to talk hell yeah they interview people now they got interviewed and they've delivered with knowledge with insight with inspiration with anything really they any question we asked them they they really took off and just talked about their and, and really showed their passion and what they are doing and in their relationship into each other and what they are doing right now and their projects and their actual plays and all of that stuff has it's really inspiring to see not only just their content but also the people behind the content be such inspiring people hell yeah it was just a fun inspiring awesome talk we had mm -hmm. and and i enjoyed every bit of it in general just awesome but yeah other than that i am doing great it's it, it's a bit warm right now for oh, the time we, we, we're already hitting 36 degrees celsius of degrees in this town yeah yeah mm -hmm. today is gonna be hot that's roughly uh 97 for our american listeners by the way so it's warm it's it, fucking it, hot for a city that is supposed to have an average temperature a year of eight degrees the, wait, wait. That 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 is supposed to be our average temperature. That's the, that, that's the average for Berlin. At least the last average I know. A, a okay, a, okay, yeah. Sh mm -hmm. So the climate chart I have here with me: Berlin average temperatures until 2022. Yeah. We have May. The average temperature there is 20 degrees. 20 degrees is something I would work with. Yeah, 15 is even better. The, the average temperature in Berlin is maximum 14.2, and mean temperature is 9.8. 10 degrees. Celsius is the average temperature for Berlin. We have 36 degrees right now outside. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's May. It's it's supposed to be a it's supposed to be around the average normally at this point in time. Maybe a bit of, a bit more than that, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to sitting in a classroom all day in the middle of fucking summer with around 40 degrees outside. If this trend keeps going on, hell no. Oh, damn, just melting away. Awesome. I, I'm so happy that the place that I move into is such as that I get the, only the midday sun and the evening sun, okay. and not, the, not the early morning sun, so I can leave my windows open early mornings because um, mm. it's pointed south completely, or, or not south, but southwest. Mm. That's good. And the second thing is that my uh, bedroom, where I will be sleeping, is really well closed off <laughs> against heat so um the co the room is completely dark anyway it should be pretty comfortable sleeping in that room not in this one because this one has sun at 7 a.m yeah i feel that because um uh, my balcony door and my bath uh, bedroom windows are facing more or less directly south maybe a bit southeast so i get sun the whole freaking day and it's fucking hot <laughs> but yeah you'll get used to it at least sun 
somewhat. Partially. Somewhat. It, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> somewhat. But getting back to TTRPGs. Ah, uh, yes. Was there anything for you this week? I had a session this Monday. Yeah, it was quite fun. My players were still in Waterdeep, tying up some loose ends and getting into the plot again, which is framing a cultist noble for murder. That's their plan. Yeah. They met with their friendly noble, they, they know, and discussed how they want to do this because I was like, okay, you need a few things for that. One of them is probably, first of all, you need the political power to even accuse this noble because... They are not, no one's going to listen to you, ragtag group of adventurers, one of whom comes from the country that is starting war with the with Waterdeep or with the Lord's Alliance. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. they're not going to listen to you. Oh, well, not as long as you have not good evidence and some backing. So they went to someone, hey, can you be the one that accuses? Can you be our accuser? And they were like, okay, yeah, works, but you need to give me an airtight case. Well, they didn't have a case because this noble didn't do anything. They just know he's part of the cult. And and they know that there's some, some hints that, for example, example, his ships have been used to smuggle wares for the cult of the Dragon Queen, but they don't know it. So now they need to go to the harbor and get the reports on his ships and hope to use that as evidence. Mm -hmm. But then they were like, can we get those reports? And I was like, well, how do you want to get them? Well, we go to the guard and ask them, why would the guard give you anything? You're not doing an investigation, right? You're you are not doing anything. You're not. You're asking to see conf uh, confidential information. Oh yeah, right. Well, then we're gonna break in. So now they are actually gonna commit a crime <laughs> to accuse someone of doing a different crime, which is very fun because I told them that that will not classify as evidence anymore if they commit a crime to get it because that's not evidence anymore. Yeah. You, you, oh well, I don't know if it's evidence or not. But I was like, well, if you commit a crime to get the evidence, that's gonna that that's not gonna hold up in court. They're going to question why you broke into somewhere. Then you could also have falsified documents. And then your case is completely dismissed. Hmm. So that's why, my players, that's why my players are now trying to do some weird mental gymnastics around this and try to find clues so they can... Because there is no evidence, right? They can't find evidence if there is no evidence. They yeah. need to falsify evidence regardless. But they need to falsify evidence so well that it seems appear to be good evidence. Mm -hmm. Remember that they are framing an actual cultist for being part of the cult. They're actually just falsifying the evidence to prove something that is completely true, which I find hilarious because maybe just be able to find the actual evidence, but no, they're not <laughs> trying to at least. So we're here, we we're doing this. I also had a second session. I just remembered that on Sunday, which is my, my Phantoms of Chaos group. My players were in the Snake Valley and they finally entered the dungeon mm -hmm. and they met their arc nemesis the nemesis for this arc this person this unt person in a black dress this weird sorcerer warlock druid something some sorcerer with some natural powers that seems to be one of the four uh, matriarchs of the unt race mm -hmm. it shouldn't be possible because all of them are dead so there's some weird shit going on there and that matriarch won they got what they wanted from this temple and they told my players three down one to go then this matriarch needs only to go to one last temple to finish their quest oh well they need to go to one last temple to do whatever they want to do and then maybe do something differently. But my players have only one chance left to stop them, in their mind at least. So now they went back with the free Medusa they saved, by the way, from a curse. Go back to the city, to the academy, explain everything, get some new gear and go back into the wilds, this time to the far north where, they, where the last temple is supposed to be kept. So they have to now venture into the ice cold tundra to find a snake temple. Awesome. And hopefully stop someone from, um, they don't know what they will do, resurrecting an old demon, ancient demon lord. That, that's a good thing to stop in general. Yeah. Especially if, it's, if he's the demon lord of war. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> around. Hmm. Um, especially also one th fun thing is my player one of my players switched characters now they they told the group after that session they were talking to me before I want to switch character I'm not feeling my character works perfectly for this group um, it feels like I've written a book for this character I've written the choices I want to make I've written the plot I want to experience and that's not working well for TTRPGs they made a mistake hmm. in creating this character in their opinion and now want a new one they created a new going character I'm not gonna say which character but I I love this character's concept. I love it because it's it opens up so many points of conflict, points of interest, points of engagement 
for everyone at the table that is incredible. So yeah, awesome. I've had a lot of fun with TTRPGs over the last week. Niels, how about you? Um, it was a bit less, or what What do I say? Um, it was less because I had mm -hmm. no sessions last week, huh? but there is one coming up this Sunday. So this will be an interesting, interesting one because this is um, Curse of Strahd, where mm -hmm. I'm a player in, and... We found the stolen holy bones of some saint that once made the church a holy ground where no undead or whatever could enter, but they were stolen. We found those bones, but some vampires spawns took those and ran off while we were fighting them. And uh, we were, I think we were fighting seven, seven or six vampire spawns, and they just sort of left mm -hmm. and now ransack the freaking town. Ha! Huh. That, that, that's not good in general. And yeah, my character is in the room where they where the fight started but didn't know doesn't know anything that is happening outside which mm -hmm. would be we got the bones back but Strat himself showed up and is now standing right in front of the player who whose character has the bones in his hand and yeah either we're all gonna die or whatever this or may be we will find out on sunday oh but yeah let's see I'm a bit anxious because I like this character that I'm playing. I don't want him to die, but, well, let's see how much say I have in that. If our maybe having some anger ish issues barbarian decides, yeah, le let's do a 1v1 against Strahd, maybe that's not a good idea. But yeah, we'll figure this out. But that's about it for me in TTRPG ways. Mm -hmm. When is your next session you're GMing? Uh, next Thursday. Ah, And then okay. again next, uh, or the Sunday after the next The 29th and the 26th are the next two days I jam. Okay, interesting, interesting. Nice. I, I really li like uh, what your GM has done with Strahd. I know I've said this so many times, but I've been loving what uh, they have been done, that they have done with Strahd and, and, and mm -hmm. the whole curse of Strahd. And I can't wait for the stories you're telling because I know how fucked up your next session is going to be. Yeah, oh God, oh God, oh God. <laughs> um, yeah, but I know how, I know that the next session will be fucked up beyond compare. <laughs> well, uh, if you don't have anything else to talk about, I don't have anything else to talk about. So we should go to a quick break and then get into episode 68. Stay tuned, people. Hey everyone, welcome to your scheduled mid-roll. If you have been enjoying Double DM either as a first-time listener or a month-long fan, thank you, thank you for listening. It's a pleasure to have you here with us sitting back and philosophizing about tabletop role-playing and game mastering and all other nonsense we throw in there. If you want to help us out though, there are a few easy ways you can help out the show. Leave a review or rating on the platform you are listening on right now. It's oft just a few clicks and types away, or even better, tell a friend about us. Spread the word about our show and how it has helped you or might help someone running their games. If you've listened to our episode on character creation or our episode on villains and think, hey, this would be a good fit for my friend that has some questions on that, send them our episode. Maybe they like it. Maybe they will love it and become our new fan and you have someone to discuss the show with. Trust me, creative dialogue is one of the best things you can do. It's why we do this. Okay, anyway, enough of me. If you are another TTRPG creator and want your product, show or project featured on the Double DM podcast right here at this point in time in the episodes, contact us on Twitter. We have paid advertisement slots as well as promo swap spots open for creators. Okay. That was the mid-roll, everyone. Thanks. Let's jump right back into the show. And with that, welcome back to the episode. Today we're talking about saying no. So, Emil, what do you what do we mean when we say saying no in a TTRPG sense? No, I won't explain that to you. Boom, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> that that was the best joke I had for the day. I hope. I don't know yet. Nils, no means when you ask me something and I say no. There's nothing different in a TTRPG sense about that, really. 
It's your players asking you something and you as the DM going, no, boom, I won't allow this. No, you can't do that. No, this doesn't work. Everything along those lines, really, about sometimes just stomping your foot on the ground as a DM and saying no. Now, one thing is we often talked about that you shouldn't do that, that you as the DM need to play with your players and that you have to collaborate with them and that you create something together and that, right, it's 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 not about you getting your way as a DM. Why are we now talking about, well, hey, you're allowed to actually do get what you want. You're allowed to say no to your players. Well, first of all, the thing is the don't say no rule that we and a lot of other people have talked about, discussed, and many people have brought up, probably to everyone listening to this, have heard that rule or said it before themselves, probably even, that rule always assumes that your players are acting in good faith. That always assumes that you can work with your players. That always assumes that when your players ask you something or want to do something, it's an average case or a best case scenario, never a worst case scenario, because the worst case scenario is never one where you want to say yes. So yes, you are allowed to say no, but there are, it's not rules that are applied to it, but considerations and thoughts you need to put in when you should say no and when you shouldn't try to say no in my opinion yeah then let's talk about that a bit more how much consideration do you usually put in before saying no well that depends really on what my players are asking because when they are asking something completely outlandish i have a good example for this so my artificer player and my paladin player they wanted to create something together or well the artificer wanted to create something with divine magic they would need divine magic, for, but they, as an artificer, didn't have divine magic because they're an artificer, right? The, their power is arcane and not yeah. divine, but the paladin had divine magic. So they wanted to perform a ritual where the paladin gave the artificer their magic to infuse an item with that. They basically wanted to create, because they fought a demon before or a demon-like creature and they thought we were going to encounter that again, they wanted to create a holy hand grenade. They wanted nice. to create a stone that would burst with divine energy once they throw it. And I was like, okay, that does not exist in the rules, how you want to do it. That doesn't exist. That, that just doesn't work, how the rules say. You don't have the ability to use the paladin's magic. That shouldn't go. And this is an instance where I could have said no, and my players would have probably understood me saying no. But I said yes, because... I thought to myself, the consideration was, okay, what do I say? Do I answer with yes and open up a very fun one-time opportunity for them to create something incredible, fun, that could be a very cool tool in a coming combat that would make them feel like badasses, like they would have prepared, like they would have played the game and me, which is something players like to do. Players like to play the game, not in a little sense after the rules, but they want to, so they want to trick the system they want to trick the gm because that is something very fun for them if they get to do something that seems completely overpowered that, that that's what they want to do and i said yes in that instance because i was like okay the consideration is if i say no what will this mean okay this means my players will not get this item this will also mean that my players will never try to do something like that again because if I then change my mind, it would seem hypocritical. And mm -hmm. that is something you as a DM do not want to be. Yeah, that was the consideration I put into this nose. I, I think I sat there for two minutes considering if I should say no. And I said yes at the end. But I went yes and there's a cost. You yep. will have to do a very volatile ritual that could potentially fail. But I gave them the chance. Right, that's one of the things. If your players ask something, for example, in roleplay or when rolling dice, there's still often a chance applied to that. So saying yet saying no there is like when you say yes there, it's not that it's an automatic guarantee that it works. There could still mm -hmm. be a role behind that it's that even if their idea is workable, doesn't work for them. You can make that idea hard. Right? If if, if your consideration is I should say no. 
because this would be too powerful, for example, for this holy hand grenade my players made. Well, I compensated that it would be too powerful with they had to do a very volatile ritual that could have unleashed that power onto them and knocked them both unconscious, probably. Yeah. So that's where that no consideration of this is too powerful comes in. It came in the yes part because I thought saying yes would be cool, but there will be a very high cost to this. Yeah, it's kind of related to the yes and and no but thing mm -hmm. because... The consideration then becomes what is the end part of yes end or what is the but part of no but. Mm. So what are the consequences of this action happening or not happening? And how could they achieve it or couldn't they achieve it? Mm -hmm. And under what circumstances? And, 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 and all of that stuff. This is something that you should think about when faced with such a decision, especially mm -hmm. if it's a harder decision. If someone just asks, can I do this and this with a spell, with a certain spell? I don't have to consider that much time mm -hmm. because it is clearly written what a spell, or most of the time, clearly written what a spell can do or can't do and then you can say yeah it could be done with this spell or no it can't that's a pretty easy case but in your case it needed a bit more consideration what could have been done and not shutting down player ideas like we talked in the episode before yeah um, well i will say right again we said in the player episode idea if you haven't listened to that go back and listen to that after this episode there will be a hundred different answers if you ask a hundred different dms i know personally at least 20 dms on twitter or discord or in personal life that would have said no to that request from my players and i would not fault none of them for it because that is their decision. That is a decision they have to make. As a GM, you have to make decisions. That's what the game gives you as a role. You're a decision maker. That also means that you have to be fair in that decision making. Yeah. But these GMs, if they say no to that request, they aren't bad. They decided that it would not serve the games, per right? assuming that these GMs are not the worst case of GM, but that there are normal GMs that want to have fun with their friends or with players around the table. They said no because they think that that request would have been not ideal or not not helpful and rather deconstructive it would have been volatile it would have it would have maybe caused problems at the table because they would have said if they would have said yes and their players then try to gamify that can we do that every day that, that, that's the consideration for example i made as well what if my players want to do this now every day i told my players that this is a one-time opportunity for them to work this mm -hmm. it might not work again but they now know that it works that allows them to try different approaches next time yeah right i don't want them to gamify this and get a holy hand grenade every single day now that's mm -hmm. what i told them i told them explicitly this is not what this is this is a I, I grant you this because this idea you have is pretty cool and i like it but if you want to do that again you will have to come up with a different idea that works off the same principle but for example now that the artificer knows they can craft with divine magic i would for example ask them next time that they would have to create a certain vessel for that magic that they can't just use a stone but have to create an actual grenade that works like a grenade yeah. for them to make it easier to cast that to have a channeling device that for example is cool because then i can allow my player to actually do something completely new because for example i also considered that player's character backstory because that character's backstory is made generally about this character wanting to create something that will change the world that is something entirely new that is never thought about or made by someone else before an invention that would shape history basically mm. this could be it for example so shutting down that idea i'm not saying that it will be the idea my player will choose because they have a long time to go before the, the campaign ends and they can choose different things along the time but this idea is something that works towards that goal of my character wants to invent something that changes the world yeah this holy hand grenade can change the world if it can be produced on mass for example for paladin armies that have to fight demon hordes or whatever right it, it's not perfect but i specifically said yes with extra consideration to my characters to the character's backstory because it would fit them to do something that isn't implied by the rules because no one has done it before and then i, I just said well no one has done it before it's just the rules say it doesn't work i say it now does for you this one time to get you rolling on that path of creating something that doesn't work in the rules because if i would shut down every idea that isn't part of the rules for my character for this character this character wouldn't bloom as a character 
And some people might say that that makes them a bad character. I say that these people that say that would make them a bad character are just bad people. <laughs> Those yeah. are people I don't want to game with because I like that character idea. I like it very much. They have a clear drive that drives them to do risky stuff like this and to explore the world I created and the plot that works around this world that I created. So that is perfect for me. I have a character I can really work with. And I have a player that is super curious and interested in finding out stuff. So why would I shut that down? Shutting that down would be disruptive. Yeah, and I feel like you saying yes in the first instance, but no to further instances of the same, exactly the same thing, entices creativity. Because they are now forced to think more creatively about different ideas and different paths they can take to achieve a similar similar outcome yeah but just going off from that initial yes but after that no mm -hmm. and what i like to do is kind of say yes and no at the same time with saying not yet you don't have the exact uh, or the right amount of or the right tool per se that you need for this certain endeavor you want to do for example if i would have been in the situation where someone would like to create a holy hand grenade but only had a single pebble basically a normal stone i would say you theoretically could, but not with the materials you have at your disposal right now. You might need to look for other materials that you can better or more safely store the holy energy in for that holy hand grenade. And then they mm -hmm. go on a quest to see what materials could be work uh, could be workable for that instant. Mm -hmm. Because that creates other stories, other quest lines, other branches, and more creativity to see what materials they can use to do certain things. Yeah, they can only create one holy hand grenade, for example, in this in instance that I have. And then they just know that they can channel divine energy as you said it, invo it involves creativity i showed them that it works the general idea stands but the way isn't perfect the way is way too risky for them they had to roll checks they had to make decisions both without knowing what the other one did and then sent me their answers to these decisions and if they would have failed at one step of this way of this two checks and this decision it would have all gone kabloom yeah. so it was very volatile it worked for them which was a moment at the table where these two players were buzzing like hell two minutes after because they were like holy fuck we actually did it no pun intended by the way <laughs> But as you said, shutting off that path that they took now stops them from gamifying it and putting it into a rule that they just have to point towards when I say, how do you do it? And more like, okay, this doesn't work anymore. But how about we do this or this or this? And those are ideas I can individually shut down again and say, no, that is even more risky. You don't want to do that. Or say, yes, do that again. Or that would work better. That I might allow you to do often. But it will be way less powerful than the first one, for example. And they will say, okay, cool. For example, the paladin can smite. And I think the description for smite reads something you um, imbue your weapon with holy energy and hit the foe and then strike them down from the heavens with a smite or something like that. But basically, a paladin is all about imbuing their weapon with divine energy that then unloads onto that enemy. That's how I imagine a smite, right? Yeah. It's not the paladin strikes and then casts a spell or something. It's the paladin strikes so heavily with such devotion and might that the soul Sword hit alone unle unleashes magic energy. That is a smite. Yeah. That's how I imagine smite. So why can't the paladin, why can't we forge a weapon for the paladin that allows them to store that magic energy from the day before? Like a spell storing sword. But that stores mm -hmm. spell slots for the paladin. Right? Because in how I imagine it, they imbue the weapon with magic energy. What if we can make it so that a weapon can actually store the magic energy without unleashing it instantly after the paladin imbued it? And that is something that the artificer can can create maybe an, a sword that can actually hold that energy in so the paladin gets more smites hmm. that is fucking cool that's an idea that they can make that's an idea that they can have that's an idea i just made up and i wouldn't say no to that i know some people yeah. would again and that's okay that's their choice but that not mine <laughs> fucking awesome that, that sounds fucking awesome that smite energy storing sword for a paladin sounds like a fun thing to do and a fun thing to craft i mean there are smart there, there are also smite spells right mm -hmm. thunderous smite branding smite i think Spearing smite wrathful S smite blinding whatever all these smites are spells theoretically mm -hmm. i could just say hey this is a spell storing sword and you store the smite spells in it that that works as well that is way easier that that, that is 
raw. But yeah. then I can also just say, then I just go that step further. And that's not too far off. Mm. And that's that's where I would say, yeah, that, that makes sense or that would work. The rules kind of imply it, but not explicitly say that it works. They do also don't say that it explicitly doesn't work, but n normally it's said only what's in the rules is actually there. But I will allow it because, first of all, I like it. Second of all, I think it's close enough. Mm. That's um, a decision. Again, it's all about decision making. Yeah, I had a similar decision to make or to if I allow this or not mm. was with one of my groups, the players got rewarded a home and they tried uh, wanted to turn this into a tavern. And yeah, that, that's a definite yes for me because that's what they want to do with their home. No question about it. But they wanted to make a special drink only available in their tavern made from good berries, but with still some magic in it. And I think in the spell description, it says that the berries then turn inert or not magical anymore after one day. But I said, hey, sure you have a master alchemist in your group and two wizards and a druid if you can't figure out how this works who will so sit together think about it roll me some checks and see if you can synthesize the magic essence of that good berry into a potion a drink or whatever and if you say yeah i want to brew it into some sort of liquor or into a good berry wine that has some minor magical effects like you feel great afterwards or you heal one hit point when you drink one cup of it or something along those lines you are the right team to do it so sit together and craft this fucking good berry wine <laughs> to still have some magic in it even though the berries after one day are inert so you might need to do it quickly you need uh, you might need to find a way to make alcohol this quickly within a day before the um, berries lose the magic and that's something that i really like or the um, idea behind it i really like and if i had said no they might not want to start a tavern anymore or might not want to think about i have alchemist supplies what else can i do with that except making mm -hmm. acid or more, making poison that's rules as written that's a poisonous kit by the way poison yeah <laughs> no but even then i never understood that these two tools are different yeah um, i understand why mechanically they are different but i allow the poisonous kit to be used as an alchemist's kit just with equipped to handle high volatile poison and I, the alchemist kit is allowed to handle high magic potions yeah that's 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 how i do it because i never understood why these two things were so different from each other in the rules or why yeah, they were so so distinct that they had to put two of these kits in right and mechanically i understand because some really just need poison and some really just need alchemy and all of that stuff but i just say both works for both if it's simple and if it's complex use one of the two tools yeah as intended they use the same or a lot of similar tools in that kit but some specialized tools for their respective field for example the high volatile magic potions versus the high volatile yeah. po uh, poisons yeah but you still have some glass beakers and stuff like that in yeah there obviously right mm. yeah some people might not want to hear what i'm about to say but as a gm every game that makes you a game master a storyteller a dungeon master a handler or whatever they all say the same thing about the role basically that you're the one to be the arbiter of the rules you are an extension of the rule book the rule book appoints you a role that is meant to enforce the rule book now that sounds a lot that sounds like I'm asking you to be a lawyer, that I'm asking you to be the judge, the high judge that strikes down everyone with might who don't play by the rules. No, I'm not. The rules specifically also say that you have a decision-making power, that you can discard the rules if you want to. GMing is not about you being more powerful than your players or your players dictating how you run your games it's about being fair yeah gming is always has always been for me about being a fair person that is balancing what my players want with the framework we want to use so sometimes saying no because the rules say so is needed because the framework is there we all decided on this framework we respect the frame work basically mm -hmm. but it's about being fair because if i allow something for another player for one player and then another player wants to do something of equal amount or similar and i say no to them they will feel disrespected they will feel unfairly treated and with right because i treated someone else better than them now and that is something you are not allowed to ever happen because that will lead to a disruptive table either one because that player will go on RPG horror stories and talk about you on that subreddit. Yeah. You don't want to be the DM on that subreddit, people. You don't want to be the DM on the subreddit RPG horror stories about GMs. You don't want to be that. And it's actually, it's very easy to not 
be there to be a very good GM. It's very easy. There are a lot of steps Nielsen and I talked about. We have 68 episodes of this show, plus panels, plus guest episodes where we talk about GMing. And it sounds like a lot, but it isn't. Because the only thing you need to do as a GM is be fair with your players. Yeah, That can be hard, but that involves knowing when to say no, knowing that you have to say yes as often as possible, and that you should only engage with those players that argue with you in good faith, that want to play a homebrew class to enhance roleplay or to enhance gameplay. Not because it's OP. You want players that don't want to cheat their way to magic items, but rather ask for the magic items because their character would want that magic item. Yeah. Because, yes, maybe it's a Dragon Slayer weapon would be good if you fight a dragon. So even if the player goes with a mechanical knowledge, can I get a Dragon Slayer weapon? That is a fair question to ask on their part if they want to fight a dragon. It's oh, all yeah. fair on you to say no, there aren't any Dragon Slayer weapons in this shop you're in. That's also fair. And the player, most players that act in good faith, or all of the players that act in good faith, which is most players, will understand. So yeah, what I want to say is jamming is just about being a fair person. Yes, you create a world and you create NPCs and you create narratives and all of that stuff, but at the core of it, a GM is just the person and the group that is best to keep the fairness alive. <laughs> that is yeah. fair to, uh, to all, that is there to sacrifice some stuff for others and yeah, GMs are just fair people. Those that are good GMs are, in my opinion, always fair to their players. That explain yeah. when they say when they have to say no, they explain why. When they say yes, it's because it would create a good moment for everyone. And that's what you have to do. Be fair. And then yeah. saying no won't be a problem because you know when to do it. Yeah, I just want to add one thing to that. Mm -hmm. That having a fair table is not the sole responsibility of the GM, but the responsibility lies mostly with the DM, GM because he makes all the decisions and stuff. But but it still has some ties from the uh, players as well. If one player tries to steal all the spotlight, then the GM needs to recreate the fairness, but it's not 100%. So what, what I didn't want to say was that GMs, that it's their sole purpose or that it's 100% only their purpose and only their job to do it. It's a table exercise, as everything is in TTRPGs. You as the GM just have more given power that you should use in the right moments, right? Making these decisions. Yeah. They are, will look to you if they want to do something that is not explained by the rules. That is your job. It's not about abusing the power you have to create the table you want. That's a table thing. If you play with your friends, GMing is not about being the leader of this group, your friends are, or the leader of the friend group and creating the best narrative ever or the best game possible. It's about having fun with your friends. If you go to the movies, do you also have that much power over your friends? No. And that same principle applies here, kinda. At least on, on the social level of TTRPGs. Yeah. It's just another activity you do with friends. Treat it like that in the social sense. But in the game sense, you need to be the one that makes the decisions. That doesn't, however, mean that your players are not allowed to help you. Some players might know the PHP and rules of D&D or whatever other system you're playing better than you. If that is the case, just ask them what they would do and they will tell yeah. you. And again, if the players are acting in good faith, which is something you will always have to assume until it's proven differently, right? We'll get to that right now. We'll get to that soon. If the players will tell you with... If they are acting in good faith, what they would do, and that is not the best outcome necessarily for them, that is the best outcome that they can see for the table fun. That is not always saying yes. Yeah. Sometimes the rules will say explicitly no, and you don't know that rule. But the player that has read the PHP from front to back five times knows the rule and says, well, actually the rules state something differently. Then you as the GM now know what is happening, but you are still the one making the decision. Yeah, you can still elect to ignore that rule and treat it more as a guideline mm -hmm. or say, okay, yeah, thanks. I didn't know about that. Let's do it that way. It, yeah. It's completely in your power to make this specific decision, mm -hmm. but not make a decision for a character. That's the job of the players. Yeah, With right. Coming back to not abusing your power as a GM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it all assumes, and I think most of our talks assume that everything happens at the table in good faith. Yeah, you will have and, to do that. Yeah, unless it is stated otherwise, we all just assume everything happens in good faith for the purpose of a better game, of a more fun game, a more enjoyable experience in general. Yeah, and, and the best advice I can ha I have for you for a table that is not acting in good faith for you, if you're a GM or a player or whatever, for the t whatever else rules 
whatever ever else is there for your table. If your table is not acting in good faith towards you, I can tell you right now, it is better to walk out on that table than to keep playing hoping for change. Because yeah. no D&D or no TTRPG is better than bad TTRPG because this is a high social activity, a high social exercise, right? It mm. can be exhausting. It can be stressing sometimes even. But we do it for fun. If you don't have fun, there is literally no meaning to it. So as soon as you realize you're not having fun, I, for example, want my players to tell me that they are not having fun and then I literally ask them if they want to leave. That's the first question I ask if they say, I don't feel like I'm having fun. I will go, okay, do you want to leave the table? No. Okay, how do we change the table then? Because... If that player doesn't feel like they're having fun, I want to know what I have to do to make it right for them. But yeah. sometimes that means them t to tell them, I don't think the fit you fit for this table then, or do you want to take a break? Sometimes that is really what you have to do. Sometimes you will just have to be firm. If a player wants to leave, let them leave. Or, or encourage them to leave even because that's mm. something because sometimes people think that ctrpgs are kind of a social obligation sometimes people think ttrpgs are a social obligation as well especially if you do it every week once a week for a year people will think that it's an appointment like a doctor's appointment or like sports or training they have to do it because it's part of their routinely week no it's a social activity you do for fun it's a hobby it's a passion it's a way to relax from work which is an actual obligation yeah don't do it if you don't want to and tell your G if you're a player tell your gms if you're not having fun because that's their ultimate goal they put in hours of hours of hours of prep and work into this campaign you're playing they just want you to have fun if you're yeah. not having fun they will make th the gms again they're acting good faith will break everything so you have fun yeah not to say that gms have to do that if they know that it would destroy the fun of others but right you remember people work together work with everyone at the table if one player is not having fun make that a table issue or not a table issue but talk to the table about it this player said that it didn't have fun how do we change that yeah and if it starts to feel like a chore going to DD or going to ttrpgs in general just say no yourself mm -hmm. that's something that you need to do as well or need to think about at least do mm -hmm. i say no to that table or to that situation in general right now or not so you have to think about those stuff, mm -hmm. things and coming back to the points you also have to consider what may it lead to and blah, 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 all of that stuff. But mm -hmm. talk about it, talk to your other players, including GM, other players, whatever. Talk to everyone at the table and talk it through. Yeah. Because as we always say, TTRPGs are a social thing that when there are problems that you need to handle socially, not with violence or whatever the fuck. Just mm -hmm. talk to someone or talk to anyone, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, but when coming back to the saying no part, we always have to have an, or at least I think so, if you say no, you have to have an explanation why you say no, mm -hmm. because then it just feels unfair if you don't have. Yeah, it, it adds a lot to the fairness if you tell your players why you do it, right? We talked about in the player ideas one that we have three rules if it destroys fun or comfort or both or whatever, then saying no is important. Then say which of those three or which of those two was broken, comfort or fun, or both. If one of the players is attempting to push one of the other characters into their death and you say no, and the players ask why, you say, well, you want to literally disrupt the fun and maybe comfort of one other player by killing their player character. Why the yeah. fuck are you doing that? You stop that or I throw you out of this table. That's stomping your feet on the ground and making a clear stance as a GM. And you need to do that because that other player probably didn't like that attempt. Yeah. I that, said that's... probably. Maybe your group enjoys that. Maybe you're playing Paranoia and that's the whole part of the game. Maybe that's that, that's what you want to do. Then obviously that doesn't account for you. But generally, killing another player character is a moment where I will say no. 100%. Because I know it will not be fun for the player that player character might get killed mm, yeah that's something that's a shitty thing to do if it's not pre-discussed if it's not pre-consented if if the others yeah. didn't say okay that's okay we do this i don't want you to excessively try it or anything but if you do it okay i understand it that's something you have to have for example in session zero yeah this isn't right if someone says well we talked about pvp in session zero this is not pvp this is something completely different pvp is those two player characters fighting each other. This is someone just attempting to 
kill the character without them having any say in it, right? I, I would say that this pushing someone into their death is not PvP or not, not covered by what people normally consider PvP. So this is not an argument these players can make. Don't fall yeah. for that. No, no, it's not, it's not player versus player. It's player treachery. Just stabbing yeah. someone in the back and trying to kill someone yeah. isn't PvP. Yeah, one thing we talked about in Vampire the Masquerade, how much treachery is allowed amongst the group. Yeah. One of us didn't want it at all. One other said, well, our both concepts are so inherently different that there might be some. And then we talked about this extensive time. And we said, well, the original goal of your group is not allowed to be, to be um, disrupted by their treachery. But if you throw someone under the bus in an argument and um, make them seem bad and you seem good for the same goal, that's okay. We, we work with that. Yep. But you're not allowed to throw someone under the bus to achieve your own goal to make it uh, and then basically disrupt the group. That's what we said. Yeah. That's what we did. And that was the discussion about that treachery because that was important for us in that campaign. Yeah, oh, we said no to hardcore treachery and all of that stuff, but we discussed it in session zero. Yeah. And session zero can prevent those situations where you have to say no a lot because you talk about the issues that might come up mm -hmm. and then already have an explanation for why you would say no in that circumstance. Yeah, yeah. If you have an... If session zero is the best way to get everyone situated. Session zero isn't just let's create characters and then get adventuring. Session zero is making sure that everyone is comfortable. I know a lot of people don't like to hear this. A lot of, a lot of people don't like safety tools. And I say fuck you to all of those people, please. I know if I say I use safety tools, I will get shit on by these players that think that safety tools are useless or bad or disruptive to their playstyle. I do not agree. I do not like that saying. Yeah, fuck those. Uh, really really if you, mean, if you listen to this podcast and haven't and, and now just realize that we like safety tools then please turn off we got your listen thank you to you because you listened to at least 40 minutes of this episode and we don't care anything else about you really we don't i'm sorry or not no i'm not even no, sorry I'm, yeah don't let the door hit you on the way out. oh please let it hit you on the way out i wanted to hit you yeah no run okay. through the wall do your thing but just go <laughs> go <laughs> disappear please and, yeah. this, and this is also not an effort you don't have to announce you're leaving i don't care if you leave okay coming back <laughs> session zero is so helpful in making sure that the game is done fairly that the game is done in good faith that the game is played so everyone enjoys it and is comfortable while doing it sure that doesn't mean that session zero is a fix all you cannot say that session zero will fix all the issues you will ever have some Definitely issues not. will come up that you've never thought about. That's something you can then later add on to different session zeros, but it didn't come up in this session zero. And that's the point where you have to say no, where you have to say no, but yes, and where you have to maybe have a table discussion after. How do we handle this now, people? We need to talk about this. This is important. Communication is never bad. Communication no. is always the key to bettering your game. Exactly. And sometimes communication includes saying no. Yeah, and I, and I feel like in a session zero or whatever you want to call it, let's stick with session zero, saying no happens more often than in-game once you have the session zero. By everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Because you all get on the same page and know what is the situation. You know what we want to do and what we don't want to do. Especially the what we don't want to do part. A safety tool is exactly that. I don't want this. No, I don't want needles. No, I don't want bugs. Easy. Yeah. And then no one mentions this. And then it's done. So we don't have to say, no, you can't do that. Or no, you won't do that. Or, or, or. It's all pre-discussed and pre-done in session zero. Mm -hmm. So saying no is most of the time a session zero thing with exceptions for certain situations that didn't get covered in session zero. Yeah. And if someone breaks your agreements of session zero, you just say no. That's the reason why you say no in mm -hmm. game when it's not a mechanical or rules thing that you have to say no to. Yeah. One quick throw in before we end this episode today. If a player make it a strike no okay, don't don't gamify this. But if if it's a strike system, your player receives three no's from you. That player might be disruptive, especially if it happens in a short period of time. If they receive a big hard no from you three times every session, they might be a player that you should look into of throwing out of the game. Yeah. This right, please 
GMs. That's, for example, one of the social powers this game gives you, but you don't necessarily actually hold. But some people think you hold. You might even hold that in your group. But for example, in my group, I don't hold that. I can't throw someone out of the table because we're in a close-knit friend group. If I throw them out, it's literally one person out of the friend group. That doesn't work. We need to do yep. that as a table. As a table, we can all say, we don't like playing with you. Please leave. I can't do that alone. But at some play tables, the GM has more power than me because it's less of a friendly friend group situation and more of a I'm the GM of this game store and I need to protect the other participants in this game store game that probably paid for this experience. Yeah. You go, please. That's something where you have more power as a GM, for example, than in, at a friend group table. And if a player is being disruptive and you think that it's too much, make find a way to throw them out of the game or ask them to leave. Maybe you can make a second game with them where they would flourish better even with new players other players but if they don't work with the table you're having they should as a player realize that they should go but some don't do that so you sometimes have to make the decision right if you're a player and you think this player is disruptive go to your gm and talk to them about it talk to someone else about it in the group if yeah. you feel comfortable doing so obviously if you're not comfortable at the table leave if you're not having fun leave if you're the one disrupting fun and get thrown out do not go whining on rpg horror stories because those people will and the right to do so yeah all assuming in good faith that will never happen so if you're a fun fair player to everyone involved in the game you have nothing to worry about nothing if you're a fun yeah. and fair gm you have nothing to worry about and i would assume that 75 or even 80 percent of all gms are good gms i with utmost certainty can say that i have never encountered a gm that i have seen on rpg horror stories because i've only played with people that i'll enjoy playing with yeah i agree to that i also never had someone or a gm or a player from rpg horror stories Mm -hmm. But I met someone that has encountered something like this, but then they just stood up and said, no, fuck this, and I'm out, and then just left. The best decision. Exactly. Many people that I wouldn't game with for their different play styles and that they wouldn't mesh with me well, those aren't bad GMs. Those are just GMs I wouldn't play with. So in that 80% are also all GMs included that I wouldn't play with, but I believe are good people. People that play games and game styles that are so inherently different from what I play that I would think I enjoy this person a lot or this person seems okay but I would never game with them and that's okay right just because you enjoy a person you don't have to game with them their games they can be completely different from what you from yours there are some yeah. people that where I would say no your play style is just not for me and disruptive to basically everyone you should go f yourself but most people like again most people are not that if you listen to this you're probably not one if you at the safety tool discussion said me 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 safety tool me me me, then you're one of those people of those twenty yeah. percent. And I'm not gonna apologize for that. I'm not gonna back down from this point. This is what I believe in. Safety tools are important. If you do not believe that, I respect your decision to never talk to me again. I respect your decision, and I don't want you to talk to me again. One hundred percent agree with that. And I think with that we have concluded our discussion about saying no. And with that, as per usual, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at DoubleDMPod or you can visit our website at www.doubledm.com. We also have, you co uh, have a Ko-Fi if you would like to donate. Feel free to do so. And if you like the show, please leave a rating on the podcasting lis podcast listening platform of your choice. And hope we hear you on the next one. Have a good day and bye-bye. Bye-bye.